My name is Elena O'Neill, and I'm 66 years old, and the COVID virus has impacted me tremendously in my life, in my thoughts, when I'm asleep, when I wake up. Um, I was sick for 45 days in the hospital after being homesick for a week, and the virus really affected me. I was on a ventilator for 20 days. I came out of the hospital on May 22nd after going in on April 7th, totally by myself. I was dropped off by my son alone and could not see anybody in my family because there were no visitors at that time at the hospital. So I was there alone for 45 days between the Beth Israel Hospital and Spalding Rehab. And now, it's months later, I've gone back to work in the middle of July. I'm a hair salon owner and I'm a hairdresser. And the lasting effects that I have right now are really severe joint pain in my knees. I did have bad knees, but they got worse. And about 70% of COVID survivors have trouble with joint pain. And I also just experienced this past six weeks hair loss. I've lost about 60% of my hair, which as a hairdresser, I do know that trauma causes all that, um, not just trauma, trauma, surgery, anesthesia, medication, mental stress, which I had all of the above, and I know that my hair will grow back, but it's, a, it's an ongoing, ongoing disease, and it's still affecting me, and I don't know how long it will be. Also, I have no sense of taste or smell, which is really not good because I don't enjoy eating. I have no appetite to begin with since the virus, and it's really difficult to get, make myself eat. When I first got sick, I was working, and they closed our salon. The city closed businesses around May 16th, and I was at home, and I started to feel really tired, and I had body aches like I had never had in my life. And I just figured maybe I was getting the flu, maybe I was just run down, because it was the end of March, and that's the time when flu season seems to be really prominent. And then I took my temperature and it was almost 104. And I haven't had a fever for about 30 years at all. Usually my fever is below normal. So I knew that I was sick. And I called my doctor and I told her the symptoms that I had. And she believed that I had the COVID virus. And I asked if I could be tested. And at the time, there was not much testing available, so I couldn't get tested. So I stayed at home and I isolated myself, as she told me to do, and I sent my son out to get me a pulse oximeter to put on my finger to check my oxygen because I have something called reactive airway disease, which is sort of like part-time asthma. I don't really have asthma, but my trachea is where I get affected, and I get, instead of bronchitis, I get tracheitis up here in my throat. And she was concerned about my oxygen, and she said if it goes below 92, please call me and you need to go to the hospital. Well, after a week, I just got weaker and weaker. I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink. My daughter was taking care of me. She was the only one that would come in to bring me food. Even at that time, I was isolated from everyone else and she was trying to get me to eat. I couldn't even drink tea. And about the seventh day I was home, I was sitting on the side of the bed and I couldn't even get up to go into the bathroom. And she said, mom, you, you look terrible. I said, I feel like I'm fading away. She said, you mean like you're dying? And I said, yes. And she called my son and they both came in and we called the doctor and she said, you need to get right to the hospital. What is your oxygen? And I took my oxygen and it was 88. So he brought me right to Beth Israel to emergency and put me in a wheelchair and wheeled me to the doorway of the emergency room, which was all plastic hanging. And he wasn't even allowed to come past the plastic with me. So they took me in and put me in a separate room and someone came in to give me a chest x-ray right away. And when I saw the chest x-ray, it was horrifying because I had had a chest x-ray a month before because I was wheezing and it was totally clear. And this one looked like a lacy valentine that someone sprinkled powder on. It was all white and it looked like all little vines. And I knew when I saw that, that I was in trouble. And the person that took the x-ray asked me if I had a COVID test and I said, no, not yet. He said, well, you're gonna get one because these are COVID lungs. So I got a test and it was positive and they admitted me right away into a room in intensive care where I stayed for three days. That was April 7th when I went in. And by the 10th, I had already been moved to three different rooms while I was in intensive care because first I was in a room that they brought another patient in and they took me out of that room because she was recovering and I was 
contagious. Then they put me in another room that looked like a utility closet. I stayed there one night, and then they put me in another room. And then these two doctors came in on the morning of April 10th at 3 o'clock in the morning, which I didn't even know what time it was. I thought it was about 9. And they told me that I needed to go on a ventilator because they had me on full oxygen, and that's dangerous to be on for a period of time because it can actually blow your lugs out. And I, they could not lower it because every time they did, my oxygen would drop. So I called my family, I called my children, and I made my son my health care proxy. He's 34, and he was in charge of all the decisions that needed to be made. And I was also a little bit upset because the doctors that told me I needed to go on the ventilator looked like they were 12 and 13 years old. And they asked me if I had any questions, and the first question I asked was how old they were. And they explained to me why I needed to go on the ventilator. And for that hour, the first hour, I was really terrified. And I needed to sign many, many papers to go on the ventilator, which I could not read 140 pages. So the nurses helped me take pictures of all the papers that I needed to read and sign, sent them to my son, and he did all that. And then I really prayed so hard. And a friend of mine that's a pastor sent me some scriptures, healing scriptures from the Bible that I read. And this feeling of peace came over me that I knew, even though my family wasn't there, I was not alone and that God was with me every step of the way. And I called my children again and I told them under no uncertain terms that I would be back and I would see them as soon as I woke up. And I went on the ventilator and after a week they tried to take me off of it and they had to put me back on after a few hours because my throat was so inflamed, it was almost closing and I was laboring with the mask on the oxygen mask, so they put me back on the ventilator. And I was on for a total of 20 days. And when I first got there, I was on, they put me on hydroxychloroquine and a Z-Pack, which some doctors right now are claiming that that's the cure for the coronavirus. And I can say under no certain terms it is not, because I got worse while I was on those. And then I was also, I was signed up for a study with the experimental drugs hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. And I got remdesivir, and that's when I started to get better. And I was also on the experimental steroid for coronavirus called dexamethasone, which they gave me when they had to put me back on the ventilator, and they knew they needed to give me that before I came off of it and right after I came off of it again. And then I also got hospital-acquired pneumonia after I got off the ventilator. So I had to go on more antibiotics for that. And I was in Beth Israel a total of 34 days. And then I had to have two negative COVID tests, which I did. And then on May 11th, which was the day after Mother's Day, I got transferred to Spalding and Charlestown. And I spent 11 days there, which they thought I'd be there over a month. And miraculously, I recovered in 11 days. And I came home. And then since I came home, Spalding asked me to be a spokesperson for them because I was the first, one of the first patients in their post-COVID program for home care. And I did some interviews for them, and I'm happy to talk to people about how this virus is real, and people need to really pay attention and start doing the right thing. For the people who think that COVID-19 is not real, well, I'm living proof that it is very real and it affects families in many different ways. I did not know how I caught the virus. I just found out recently in the past two weeks that I probably caught it from my husband who had a really bad cough from the end of February to the middle of March and he recovered at home from it. He Thank God he was strong enough that he didn't even go to the doctors or he just treated himself and he recovered from it. So right then and there somebody could have it and you not, not just not know. My daughter couldn't taste or smell for a couple of days before I got sick, and that was also a symptom. And at the time, like I said before, they weren't doing much testing. So there were many people walking around that have no symptoms, and you cannot take a chance that you're not going to catch it because you don't know who's walking around with it. It's a silent disease. Some people do get really sick, and you know they have it, and then there are other people walking around that can just pass it on to you without you not even being aware of it. And you have to be so careful with wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, trying not to go anywhere 
where there are crowds, where people are not social distancing, because this is just going to keep going around and around and around if people don't wake up and do the right thing. As we were at the beginning, even before they closed my salon, I was wearing a mask. And to protect ourselves and my family, we do not go anywhere where there are big groups. We, we've been invited to many functions and we've mostly turned them down. We only go places if we just started to even eat out. It's going to be somewhere outside where there's plenty of room around us. Um, we don't go like I said, anywhere with crowds, we wear masks, we social distance, we all have many masks in our cars, we wear them all the time when we're out with people. If people think that that's you know, not necessary, that's too bad. We have to protect ourselves because my family was greatly affected by this, by my illness, by my daughter, not being able to taste or smell still since March. My husband, who we didn't even know he had it until he recently had a fall and has been in the hospital, and he got tested. They wouldn't test him because he had no symptoms, and now he had an antibody test, and he has many antibodies, so we know that he had it. So we just, we just follow the rules. We wear masks, we social distance, we wash our hands a lot, and we try to stay away from people. To the people that are walking around not wearing masks and think this is a joke, just put yourself in the place of a person like myself who was really sick. Or put yourself in the place of a person that were not even as lucky as I was and lost their parents or their children or their siblings or their best friend. And be respectful of other people. If you were in their place, I'm sure that you would greatly appreciate people wearing a mask around you and just being respectful to, to having consideration and being kind enough to care about others more than you care about yourself.